but record on this computer. Now I'm going to start again with this fantastic in intro. Yes. And you're going to get to hear the song again. More meat, less meat. Heartbeat. I will teach you not to bite me. More meat, less meat. What is actually meat? Okay, everyone, welcome to Meet Meets, our webinar series uh, that's part of the Norwegian Research Council funded project mitigation. Um, I am very happy and honored to introduce Mina Kanerva today. Uh, Mina is going to talk to us about uh, consumption corridors and the case of meat. Before I give uh, the floor to Mina, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, our project that is uh, funding the webinar series. Um, the project is a transdisciplinary project, so that means that we're crossing uh, uh, academic disciplines, but also partners outside academia. Um, and uh, uh, we are including, uh, besides farming, restaurant, provision, and climate communication and culture actors, also partners in the arts. Hence this uh, fabulous song that you heard us uh, introduce the series with. Um, our project is uh, exploring how to transform meat use, specifically in Norway, uh, a, a typical high meat consumption, high meat consuming uh, nation of the global north. And we have articulated three principles to guide us into thinking about what sustainable meat use is here. Uh, and these are recognizing the animals and the people who are involved in making meat, replacing uh, where possible animal-based protein with plant-based protein or alternatives that have a lower climate hoofprint, such as insect-based protein, and refining how we use meat to match our needs versus our wants, and so to reduce waste and also reduce malnutrition and obesity. Uh, if you are joining and also uh, tweeting and like sharing information or your impressions on this webinar on social media, these are, this is a handle that you can use, the Meet Meets. And these are our accounts if you would like to follow us. There's also an actually an uh, Instagram account that I forgot to add here. Uh, okay, so um, I will give the floor to Mina now. Uh, and um, stop share and say a little bit about Mina's work and Mina's uh, production. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Mina Canerva currently works as a senior researcher in Artec, a sustainability research center at the University of Bremen. She has uh, started with, uh, with her research on uh, meat consumption about 10 years ago. Uh, when reducing meat consumption was not such a mainstream research topic. Uh, she started doing some basic quantitative analysis on trends in meat consumption and following from that quantitative to qualitative data, uh, looking at European discourses around meat. Uh, her PhD thesis was in sustainability science on, su on such discourses related to the transformation of meat eating related practices. Uh, overall, her research is working, uh, is uh, focused on societal transformations and she works on the sociology uh, towards uh, sustainability, <laughs> not any societal transformation. She works on the sociology of meat, on consumption corridors and sufficiency, uh, linking practice and discourse, and also the notion of strategic ignorance. So uh, thank you, Mina, and uh, please, you may unmute. Thanks, Sophia, for the for the introduction, um, and thanks for the opportunity to take part in this um, webinar series. Um, it seems that my microphone is not working, but I maybe that's you can still hear me fine. Okay. And can you say something? Yes, yes, I can hear you. If anyone can't hear her, okay. you can uh, I, I raise see. your hand. But I feel like we're all with you. Yes. This is not working. Um, 
Yeah, so I'll share my, my screen. You can see the slide? Great. Okay, so my presentation will look at a relatively new concept within sustainable consumption research, namely consumption corridors. And I'll apply it in the context of transforming the meat system. A bit more about the content. Firstly, I'll briefly go over the two main kinds of sustainability governance. Then I'll explain the basics of consumption corridors and move on to applying the concept um, to the theme of meat. And I'll do this firstly by presenting the challenge and then by discussing the planetary health diet, which is increasingly a popular proposition um, on transforming the global food system. Then I'll try to answer the question, why should we have meat consumption corridors. After this, I look at potentially generating change through metaphors that relate to meat eating. And finally, I'll make some suggestions on how to actually go about applying consumption corridors to transform the meat system. And I'll also consider what the larger relevance of meat corridors could be. So, um, a useful distinction within sustainable consumption governance can be made between weak and strong governance. The weak approach is often called the efficiency approach and the strong approach, the systemic approach. But what exactly is the difference? Um, the weak approach involves giving consumers information subsidizing sustainable solutions and taxing unsustainable practices, nudging and choice architecture, among others. If effective, this approach would lead to less resource and carbon intensive con consumption. However, this form of governance has not been and is not effective anywhere close to the scale and speed it needs to be. Barriers to getting the efficiency approach to actually bring about enough change include asymmetry in the power and knowledge between corporations and consumers, um, lock in to path dependent structures, whereby lock in refers to consumption driven by structural and institutional features of society, usually outside individual choice and general inertia towards change, which is um, embedded usually in humans. On the other hand, the strong approach involves the methods used in the efficiency approach, but in addition, it involves also reshaping more fundamental patterns of consumption. Additionally, it aims to change institutions and paradigms to be in alignment with sustainable systems. If employed, this approach is more likely to lead to sufficiently less resource and carbon intensive consumption. However, there are of course considerable barriers realizing this approach. These include lots of unknowns as to how to actually bring about the changes and this systemic approach has also generated a lot of resistance until now, but it is arguably necessary. Um, just as an example, if, for example, GDP growth as the goal of the system, in other words, the main objective of economics, uh, of economies would be replaced with well-being related measures, it might already be politically easier to make other large changes to the system. And that's, of course, one of the, 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 the strongest um, leverage point in, in the leverage point theory. Um, consumption corridors belong to the strong approach to sustainability governance. And I will now explain some features of this concept at a general level. 
First of all, the concept originates in a large transdisciplinary research program financed by the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research, also known as BMBF, um, over 10 years ago. The research program was called From Knowledge to Action, New Paths Towards Sustainable Consumption. The first publication containing the concept of consumption corridors came out in 2013. There have also been workshops and panels developing the concept uh, further in the last years, and the concept is now being applied in research. But so what exactly are consumption corridors? Um, the goals of the approach are absolute reductions in the negative impacts of consumption from especially a planetary viewpoint and allowing individuals to meet their fundamental needs for a good life. Basically, therefore, consumption corridors are a needs-based approach and they focus on the positive rather than on restrictions. However, it is also crucial to make the distinction between what are objective needs and subjective desires, on the other hand. And I'll, I'll get back to this difference later in the need context. Finally, consumption corridors aim for both global and transgenerational justice. Regarding the structure of the corridors, here is one sketch from a, from a publication um, of three different corridors. And in the next slide, I will describe the structure more specifically. So the floors are defined as the minimum that everyone has a right to have access to. And the ceilings are defined by planetary limits and they form the maximum consumption levels that let others have their needs met sustainably. Um, the corridors are also meant to be dynamic so that they change over time, depending on changing needs and planetary limits. So some corridors might shrink or disappear over time while new ones might be born. And the sketch here illustrates this dynamism with the time dimension. The corridors should be a product of deliberative processes with citizen consumers, focusing on the good life, on needs and on acceptable limits to freedom. The deliberative process involved in setting up the corridors can be compared to other increasingly popular participative methods of decision making, such as climate assemblies. Um, in the last few years, the concept has entered more general research. Um, consumption corridors have been experimented with on a small scale, and there are initial positive results on people regarding the concept as fair and reasonable on an abstract level. This has been tested, for example, in focus groups in Switzerland. In other research, consumers have been able to agree minimum and maximum limits for example, to parts of their laundry related energy consumption. Other studies have involved the consumption of information and communication technologies and the use of public parks in cities. There have also been theoretical applications of the concept in various areas of consumption, such as consuming living space. And further, one paper has considered the impact of the corridors on different life stages of individuals. And last year, a special issue on the journal Sustainability, Science, Practice and Policy came out on consumption corridors. Um, and this background image uh, to my presentation symbolizes these corridors, as you may have guessed. Now I move, move to the meat context. Um, which is one of the big challenges for sustainability. Um, in other words, the current meat system, which includes the massive industrial production and high level consumption of cheap meat that the industrial production enables. 
The current meat system involves not only powerful industries, but also sticky, effective and polarizing practices. And, and this makes it more extreme in terms of the challenges than most other major areas of unsustainable consumption. These aspects have also made transforming the meat system, including consuming radically less meat when consum wherever consumption levels are high, particularly unpopular among both the general populations and politicians. And so until lately, the issue has largely been ignored. The meat system is very challenging, but at the same time, as we know, also necessary to tackle, for example, due to its role in the biodiversity and climate crisis. To address the unsustainability of the global food systems, the planetary health diet was developed in 2019 by the Eat Lancet Commission on Food, Planet and Health. Um, most of you are probably familiar with this reference diet, so I'll just discuss it briefly. The main focus of the project was on how to feed a future population of 10 billion people by 2050 a healthy diet within planetary boundaries. The planetary boundaries considered include the total global amount of cropland use, biodiversity loss, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, and nitrogen and phosphorus pollution that can be due to food production. The reference diet offers concrete targets for food consumption while accommodating different cultures and different dietary preferences. And the authors also give detailed recommendations for sustainable food production. Importantly, um, this past summer, Eat Lancet 2.0 was launched. And the aim of this new project is to generate further knowledge and guidance for the food transformation, focusing in particular on diversity, adaptation, and food justice. Um, a small part of the planetary health diet is shown in this table. And as you can see, it includes the main four types of meat produced worldwide. And the suggested daily amounts are small, especially for red meat. The calorie intake is, is of course re relevant here. Um, the authors of the report consider the amount of 2,500 kilocalories a day for the entire diet enough on average, but it is less than the current world average, which is close to 3,000 kilocalories. And the last time that the world average was around 2,500 was in the late 1970s and early 1980s. But so to conclude, these amounts of meat at a global level are calculated as being sustainable for the planet. And therefore this diet could well be used as a starting point for developing consumption corridors for meat. So then what would be the point of having meat consumption corridors? At a general level, meat is not only a nutritional need satisfier, among others, but it can also be seen as a synergistic need satisfier, relating to daily life and family, but also to being part of a community in connection with social food traditions or social eating, where meat still plays a more central role. So it satisfies multiple needs. Meat is in fact often satisfying subjective desires rather than objective needs. And this difference between needs and desires or necessities and luxuries um, becomes relevant when luxuries are unsustainable. And the problem with meat in this sense is actually twofold as the amounts consumed are often unsustainable and unnecessary from a nutritional point of view. But at the same time, meat is often seen as a necessity rather than a luxury, especially in the global north. So as we know, 
meat is a very particular, very um, tricky issue to tackle, but this fact can actually make the corridor approach um, fruitful because Firstly, seeing that consumers have a right to a low sustainable level of meat consumption, whether it is a necess necessity or a luxury, is useful and positive. Secondly, consumption corridors give consumers freedom up to a point. Thirdly, when seen as fair, the approach may bring less public resistance in a particularly emotional and polarizing issue, such as meat. And fourthly, consumption corridors bring a global view to the meat system challenge. In certain locations in the global south, such as in sub-Saharan Africa, better access to meat can improve health, while in many other world regions, meat consumption needs to be cut radically. Finally, for many reasons, we cannot leave the meat system alone, even if restricting production or consumption still is a societal taboo in many sense, in, 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 in many ways. We also cannot rely on the ineffective and slow efficiency approach. And finally, we cannot eliminate all industrial meat production and consumption in the very short term, at least. The urgency of effectively responding to the climate and biodiversity crisis, however, requires radical action in the short term. In other words, to be able to reach general near-term global climate and biodiversity targets, it would be essential to use strong governance methods on the meat system. Then I'd like to discuss two metaphors that can be useful for the transformation process as one way to generate change in society is by changing metaphors. These two metaphors are present, present in the data there that I analy analyzed for my doctoral thesis a few years ago. And the data come from discussions in the online Guardian newspaper between 2015 and 2017. The continuum of meat ways is the first metaphor and refers to the continuum shown here. Um, it incorporates different ways to eat or not eat conventional meat. As you can see, the left side of the continuum means more meat and the right side less meat. The red box on the right side illustrates where a possible consumption corridor for meat could be. Since different ways to eat meat are often closely linked to different ideologies or societal paradigms, the ideological aspects and how often meat is eating, eaten are not easy to separate at a general level. And the labels under the continuum relate to this, and I'll briefly explain some of them. Societal carnists prefer to eat meat on a regular and often daily basis, out of a habit, a social convention, or because they just like meat for its taste and other qualities. At the same time, these people are often somewhat uneasy about their diet, and therefore they employ various coping strategies, such as strategic ignorance, to deal with the conflict called the meat paradox. A societal carnist has normalized regular meat eating, usually as a small child, as most current societies tend to be supportive of meat eating. Individual carnists, on the other hand, would be likely to specifically support the killing of animals for meat. And typically this can involve being indifferent and not strategically ignorant to the fate of animals, and possibly also to other negative impacts arising from the meat system. Further, the difference between a weak flexitarian and a strong, strong flexitarian relates more to practices, but it can have an ideological basis as well. A weak flexitarian eats meat on most days of the week and a strong flexitarian about once a week or less. 
most people in Western societies still probably fall somewhere between societal Garnists and Greek flexitarians. So then the journey metaphor refers to a transformation at either an individual or at a societal level along this continuum, moving towards less meat or sometimes perhaps also more meat. Further, the so-called new meats and new meat ways foster the two metaphors. The new meats refer to, for example, cultivated meat, new generation, plant-based meat, fermented meat and insects. And the new meat ways refer to eating these new meats plus vegetarianism. So from the data that I looked at, for example, cultivated meat can be seen as a great halfway house on the journey. And plant-based meat can be seen as transitional food when on transit, in other words, on a journey towards vegetarianism. And flexitarianism can be seen as going as far as you possibly can on the path towards less meat. Using these metaphors, in discourses about the transformation in meat can be beneficial because they are much less polarizing than the meat, no meat dichotomy that has been common until now. They reduce the need for negative coping strategies to do with the meat paradox, such as strategic ignorance of knowledge related to the meat crisis. And they also allow for slower and faster journeys along the continuum with less struggle and without loss of identity as a vegetarian, for example. It's quite obvious that um, applying the concept of consumption corridors is not an easy task in current societies. So I want to present some suggestions on, on how this could be done for the meat context. This how-to part is actually something I want to explore further in the near future. And so I would really appreciate any comments you might have. Firstly, in terms of research, and this is something that could be done more or less right away. Um, participatory research projects can be carried out around the idea of meat consumption corridors with consumer citizens and other relevant stakeholders, such as policymakers, civil society organizations, farmers and meat industry actors. Hopefully such projects could demonstrate that meat corridors and consumption corridors also more generally could be in principle acceptable to consumers and perhaps some to some of the other actors as well. The research results should be disseminated as widely as possible. The concept can be brought into broader recognition in public discourses while attempting to influence values, meanings, and paradigms with the help of campaigns and actions by NGOs and other civil society organizations, and perhaps also by governments. These actions should of course be informed by prior research and the goals of such actions should be to develop and increase public discourses on the nature of meat consumption corridors and the reasons for having them. Question and hopefully change the still widely held meat consumption related values and paradigms, for example, that meat is normal and necessary. Increase awareness of strategic ignorance related to challenged practices such as meat eating. Bring in the journey and continuum metaphors to reconfigure discourses, to decrease polarization and to facilitate change. Improve the image and meanings of healthy, low-tech plant-based options, such as beans and lentils, in other words, pulses. And finally, engaging the emerging alternative meat industries, working on developing new meats, could be beneficial in order to further increase and widen the discourses. Further trials would be an important component and therefore cities or regions 
could run local level projects of participatory processes to set up consumption corridors for meat and apply the corridors in public food provisioning at the local level. Here, existing city projects such as Veggie Days, such as the one in Ghent in Belgium since 2009, could be an example. Simultaneously, competencies related to cooking vegetarian meals should be increased within existing food system structures. Further, national level trials of participatory processes of setting up corridors could be run, in particular, to justify near future policies on the production, trade and consumption of meat. And this could partly even be justified as responding to demands from civil society organizations or even citizens. Finally, regarding state level action in terms of actual policies, governments should carry out more comprehensive processes to set up actual corridors for meat. Adjust the national food guidelines strictly in line with a planetary health diet, such as the one developed by the Eat Lancet Commission, and incorporate the new guidelines into education and other information. Apply a planetary health diet in all public food provision, while again increasing competencies related to cooking vegetarian meals from pulses, for example. Use other state level instruments, such as taxes, subsidies, and regulating advertising, aiming at sufficiency and recomposing consumption. And importantly, apply the implications from the corridors to agricultural policies at the national and regional levels, including support to transitional transitioning farmers while avoiding outsourcing meat production to other countries. The main goal is sustainable agriculture with radically reduced negative impacts. As a recap, the, recap, the suggested actions in the last few slides fall as a whole within strong sustainable consumption governance. These actions would probably be best partly successive and partly parallel. However, the order of actions matters. Um, as said, meat is a very effective and polarizing theme and the meat system contains high levels of industry power. Additionally, consumption corridors more generally can easily create a conflict with the currently dominant economic paradigm. Therefore, regulatory and economic instruments or any comprehensive state level action, in fact, may be the hardest to get accepted, even when otherwise effective. It's therefore likely that state level policy action is more feasible when societies have already been primed for the harder measures with widened public discourses or even demands for change, and with local level trials that receive publicity. Some conclusions to the presentation, first to the consumption corridor approach more generally. When successfully adopted, the corridor approach can lead to systemic change as the approach should limit consumption and change production and reconfigure both towards sustainability. Additionally, it can change paradigms and drive, even drive economic growth to be second in importance as compared to the rights of everyone to achieve the minimum level of consumption and societal responsibility to stay below the maximum level. Due to their participative nature, consumption corridors can be a way for governments and citizens to cooperate. And this could mean less resistance from electorates and even certain empowerment of citizens. If successfully implemented, the deliberative processes to build corridors should start to disrupt current practices. However, the general challenges common to strong sustainable consumption governance are considerable. 
then some conclusions regarding meat consumption corridors. When implemented also on the production side, the approach should help transform the existing meat system. The planetary health diet works as the beginning of a comprehensive plan, including a transformation towards sustainable agriculture. But important here again is to note that the second stage of the Eat Lancet project, Eat Lancet 2.0, will go further into the local and regional implementation of the planetary health diet. The big question is, of course, how to get individuals and societies to accept transformation. And I believe that using the consumption corridor concept could greatly support and facilitate the transformation towards the planetary health diet due to the concept's clarity, fairness, and flexibility. Additionally, the new meats are already disrupting the status quo and fit well within the corridors. And employing the two metaphors of a journey and a continuum can further help to reconfigure meat-related discourses and paradigms to decrease polarization and to facilitate and accelerate change. Um, and I want to still briefly discuss the general feasibility and potential relevance of meat consumption corridors beyond food systems. Meat consumption is an area where citizen consumers have some political agency that the corridors can realize. Meat corridors can work in the current market system when one consumption, consumption item or one need satisfier with high negative impacts, in other words, animal-based meat, is partly exchanged for another need satisfier with far fewer negative impacts, for example, pulses or plant-based meat. At the same time, total food consumption is not necessarily reduced. And this may be important at the paradigm level, even if it's still very disruptive to the meat industry itself. Meat consumption related practices are already destabilizing due to the new meats, new discourses, more awareness, some actual reduction in consumption with Germany as a case in point. And finally, due to emerging policy efforts. For example, there are now several IPCC reports remarking on the importance of food system transformation. In other words, this might be a, sustain, a suitable time to intervene in meat consumption related practices. While meat, meat corridors do not propose less consumption, they can still prepare society to consume differently by exchanging unsustainable consumption for more sustainable consumption. Thereby, they could help prepare us for the larger transformation outside the meat system. So I ask, are meat consumption corridors a so-called next best transition policy step? One with great transformational potential and one which could be also feasible, even considering the constraints of current capitalist state systems. And finally, I want to still mention a couple of things related to this topic and to my own work right now. An article um, by me on meat consumption corridors just came out a few days ago in the Journal of Consumer Policy. Um, please have a look if you're interested. Um, further, I've just started working on a project proposal on this topic. And the idea is to explore both the acceptability of the meat corridor concept and to get views on the how-to of meat consumption corridors. The methods will include expert interviews, possibly consumer focus groups, questionnaires or interviews, and probably media discourse analysis. I also plan to compare countries, at least two, but possibly up to four countries. And um, yeah, so that's the plan. And if you have any comments or suggestions uh, on this, please do let me know. I would really appreciate um, any, any comments on this. 
and you can always contact me by email later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, you're right on time. Actually, already we have time left. Um, so I propose that we take, a, say, a 15 minute break, a people or 10, 15 minute break. Uh, we try to be back by uh, 325. And in the meantime, you can also place questions uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, so for uh, people attending the session, you can send us your questions and we will uh, pause a little bit and resume in uh, at uh, 25 past the hour. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you. Excellent and uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Okay, yes. see you all in a bit. See you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to the Q&A uh, session. So um, thank you Mina for this very interesting and rich talk and for discussing the concept of consumption corridors for me and how to uh, really implement uh, that in practice. Um, do if people have questions for Mina, uh, you can raise your hand, uh, and you are allowed to ask your question. Um, does anyone have a question for Mina? Or shall we have a kind of open discussion? I think David. I see David uh, Worrell. Uh, you are. Uh, Fine to unmute yourself, I think, David. Thank you. Sure. Uh, would it be possible to use the chat as a way of posting more considered questions? I I'm not sure you can try, but I think the tool disabled that we're, at the moment. Yeah, I think we are allowed to use the Q and A tool. If you see at the bottom, it says Q and A. Oh yes. And there you can write your question. In that space, uh, if you would like to take the time to articulate it. Okay, let me try. Yes, and uh, if you want, I can ask a question in the meantime. How does that work? Uh, so you uh, click there. Oh, very, very good. So would you like me to read I can, it? I'm happy to read it. I'm happy to read it. But, uh, please, do, please do it, David. So, uh, Mina, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, in it, you seem to assume that the eating of meat is a problem and originates mainly from cultural desires, not nutritional needs. You do not distinguish between different production methods, yet we know that the methods employed, for example, feedlot versus pasture raised, have radically different impacts in terms of both planetary impacts and nutritional needs. The same can be said about the production of plants and plant-based products. Would you care to comment on the impact of production methods on your corridor model? Thanks. Thank you, David. Mina, uh, feel free to uh, take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not considering only uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This is, you know, of all the different, I mean, different needs have different problems in, in um, 
poultry production, for example, a big problem is the development of, of uh, various viruses, which then um, transfer into humans and um, anti um, antibiotic resistance. And, you know, so it's, it's not just about CO2 emissions. Um, I understand that. And, and um, I'm not, yeah. Uh, if I can just clarify my point, uh, uh, you, you, when you talk about production, you seem to always be talking about, uh, you focused on one type of like mass production, monocultural yeah. production, and yes. that's not w the way everybody produces. That's not the no. way. And the, the, the outcomes are radically different. Yes. And I'm uh, not saying we should stop eating meat. I mean, this is the whole point. But the industrial production should stop. Yeah. And then the, then the numbers have to come down because we cannot produce the same amounts without the industrial um, production method. Well, okay. Um, that's an assertion, isn't it? It's being calculated. I mean, it's just yeah. not going to happen. Okay. Thank you, David. I also would like to follow up on this because there have been also challenges to the idea that there is such a radically better impact once we do grass feeding, for example, uh, as opposed to intensively farmed um, uh, meat. So I, I'm thinking here of uh, George Monbiot's book, um, mm -hmm here um oh i have i forgot the title Regen 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 yeah new generation yeah. yeah so uh i mean his research is on the uk so uh i'm not sure how much to extrapolate for that but it it's quite actually provocative um and suggesting that we radically reduce our consumption of meat um but uh, so he does research that's also questioning regenerative farming and how much better that is in the end for this is the journalist you're talking about right? yeah the yeah. journalist yeah, yeah he yeah. has done some interesting work on that yeah yeah, yeah i've heard it. his argument yeah uh but uh we can continue but i i just want to open the floor to okay. other questions or or you know so continuing with this line of uh, thinking here uh thank you Thank you, David. Um, I see. Maybe I will lower your hand, David. Um, well, I can ask a question since uh, maybe I can <laughs> take the time for other people to, and other people can think. So um, I was interested in, uh, I think the co I have a couple of questions. One is a more conceptual about the idea of a consumption corridor. And um, I, I think it's a very interesting concept and uh, metaphor, as you say. And I was, this, this is partly a comment. So the comment was thinking about another, other concepts, like it could be a, a tunnel, you know, something more restrictive, like looking at it as a consumption tunnel or a consumption, uh, I don't know. Um, of course, the, the idea of, the, of donut economics, Kate Rayworth's uh, uh, work here also came to mind because there's a similar idea of like a, a lower and upper bound to, uh, to consumption, but you have an interesting kind of temporal dimension uh, which the donor, at least the static donor, doesn't capture. So I thought maybe you can comment a little bit on that, like, um, and the 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 concept and the metaphor of the consumption corridor itself, and how to communicate that idea. Do you think it like how much of an impact do you think it's making? Of course, the corridor is kind of maybe you know a dubious thing. Sometimes you see corridors and like horror films and like you have these like corridors that you don't know where they're going or <laughs> but kind of better than a tunnel but so I was thinking a little bit about this the the word uh, the concept of a corridor and uh what could be a I don't know kind of 
fun corridor uh, <laughs> uh, or appealing corridor. Um, so that's one question. And the, the other comment I had, I am very also very happy and excited to see you're applying for a research project and, um, and uh, you know, tr getting the support to sort of implement some of your uh, research now in practice and explore it in practice. And something that I think has been interesting in our work uh, has been this collaboration with uh, artists and people in the cultural sector as as uh, uh, part of the idea that food is culture. And so changing our food practices would also involve to some extent transforming culture or thinking about food as culture. And I wanted to add that as a possible tool or also barrier <laughs> for uh, for um, getting people on board uh, with the, some of your suggestions and also as a means to uh, test out or explore um, through uh, artistic research or other modes of research, uh, such a transformation. And this concept also of the food uh, and consumption corridor. So thank you very much, Mina. I, like, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be thinking about your talk for a bit and we'll be able to talk further. Uh, but uh, yeah, these were two comments for you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, corridor. Um, it, it's in whatever the, the image is, it, it needs to have a floor and a ceiling. So tunnel kind of like goes underground, isn't it? <laughs> so that's also a bit scary. <laughs> Um, yeah, I thought corridor is nicer than the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, I think corridor is nicer for sure. But but how how to you know how to make you know, it? Thinking about a slide or you know like that kind of is fun, like a water slide or or something that's kind of going somewhere interesting and new could be fun. I, I, I I'm right. just thinking out loud right now, but. Uh, yeah, or if you if you had any thoughts about that, that's the, the corridor to the future, <laughs> the future where you know this problem has been solved. Um, I, I just wanted to say about the the donut model that yes, of course, it has the same 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 kinds of limits, but the the difference is that it doesn't actually focus so much on consumption. It's sort of implied that this you know is part of it, but with the consumption corridor. It is really considering overconsumption to be the root cause of unsustainability, and therefore, it's directly addressing that. So I think that's a that's a an important difference. Um, how to communicate? I, I think this whole idea of inc involving artists. I mean, that's brilliant. Um, and I, I'd love to hear more about what you do in with that in your own project. Um, in, in terms of involving our artists in in the communication, you know that that would be the idea, I guess, that um, with their help, it should be it could be more. So it could be somehow easier to communicate. Yeah, yeah. or also to explore a bit. You yeah, know, and uh, explore. some of uh, our collaborators, like the, I'll say, just a little comment on this since you asked. Um, you can find some information on the project website and we are going to also have an exhibition coming up in uh, next year, early next year in Trondheim. Uh, mm -hmm. You're all very welcome to attend this and we also will have a live pro program with events and lectures uh, so we can be in touch about that. But the exhibition is um, uh, curated by the Center for Genomic Gastronomy, and um, uh, they are they are a bio artist uh, collective, as well as Chickson Speed, um, who are uh, uh, con performance artists, also working with music, and so um, these are people who have been working with us on these ideas of like imagining future food. In, understanding what it is to be meat or perform meat. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it has been quite productive now uh, in publications and also in this kind of output 
uh, like songs we are going to release songs etc <laughs> so uh so yeah i see a hand by uh, silvia coutinho who is also uh one of our collaborators and uh, coming from nutrition science uh, so silvia uh, thank you for attending for your contribution yes uh, I would put my camera on, but I don't know how to put it, so yeah. I have to it has to be with my voice if it's uh, okay. I feel like <laughs> I can't try. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not, like I'm just to... saying that uh, no, it's the same. Just to say that uh, okay. it's not. Uh, it's for me. It's the same. If, if you want, you can put it. But just to say that. Let uh, me see. I'll... Let me see if you can do it now. Let's see. Are you able to do it? Are you still are you still there? Oh yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I think it's nicer to see faces. I, I mean, I respect when people don't want, but I think it's uh, nice to see faces. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Sofia, for organizing this and uh, for inviting such an interesting talker and speaker. I mean, and a very nice. Uh, uh, presentation. Uh, as Sophia said, my background, I'm a clinical dietitian, so I'm from more the medical side. I collaborate in a mitigation project, and it, so I've been, of course, uh, uh, very much exposed to other ways of uh, uh, understanding meat consumption, but it was really interesting. I was really um, excited <laughs> with your talk. And um, I wanted to, to, to bring this, uh, you, you, when you were showing this continuum of the consumption or you have like this, let's say two extremes, right? And in one side, the left side from the viewer was the, this uh, individual carnist and then also the societal, societal carnist. And I know that you explained that, uh, but because for me it was, were two new concepts that were divided, I never see, I never understood and never thought about those concepts be splitted. So if so, one thing that uh, if you don't mind, I would like to listen more about that, what distinguished them. And also because of these principles that you were bringing that is connected to the, you know, clarity, fairness and the flexibility, uh, how in this context of the, these three principles of clarity, fairness, and, uh, and flexibility, these individuals that are more in the left side, or we have the individual and the social car car um, carnist, uh, how, they, how, how are they understood? And uh, if we can bring also uh, in, in, in connection to this meat replacement, so let's say this new meat, mm -hmm. I noticed that you uh, often mention pulses, which I really like it, I have to say, because if I have to make a, 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 a this, so if I, if I can say, I'm quite uh, skeptical about these uh, uh, meat replacements that are ultra processed, mm -hmm. because I, of course, uh, it's an interesting product to uh, fight the climate change, but we cannot forget the other side that is connected to the health. And uh, I'm not I'm I'm not sure if we are actually bringing a problem to try to solve a problem by by focus so much in these uh, ultra processed meat uh, uh, replacements. So I really like it that you use pulse. And uh, anyway, there is already in the market these meat replacements that uh, I just mentioned. So if you could somehow. Uh, have a bit of, uh, again, explanation, the difference between these two group of individuals having these three principles and how this can be understood for the, in the context of these new meats, right? Um, yes, I, I'm not sure if it was clear and uh, uh, yeah, that was my comment, maybe question. Thank you again. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, Mina, are you okay? Do you understand the question? Yes. Yes, there was just one um, guy, but I was trying to rush back to my slides to, okay. <laughs> to check, check what I did actually say there. It was flexibility, clarity, and what was the third word? Fair, uh, clarity. Fairness, yeah, fairness. Yeah. Yeah. Fairness. Oh, 
Okay. Um, yeah, first. Um, okay. Um, the one thing that I wanted to say about the new meats is that I, I really quite agree that they're ultra processed and, you know, not really healthy. The original meat may not be super healthy either, but, you know, these are also not healthy, just in a different way, perhaps. Um, but then again, people do eat a lot of ultra processed food. So replacing one kind of ultra processed food with this might not be, might not make, make things worse, but it also won't make things better for, for health. But I think what they have done, in, what is really important and maybe the, the only positive thing about them is that they've changed, they changed the definition of meat, you know, they've brought these new discourses and they've brought this, brought this new awareness, you know, because people now recognize the, their existence, you know. Um, I, I think that's by now it must be quite, um, I don't know if anybody has done a, done research on this, on this just to ask population, you know, do you know what cultivated or cultured or whatever lab meat is or something, but but I think it's it's quite widespread by now. Um, this 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 awareness. So it has really changed um, the definition, and it has sort of questioned that meat has to come from animal sources, and you know what do we actually eat, and and why, and you know. So I think that's their really important contribution. Um, so so then it was the difference between the individual and the societal carnist. In this particular, if we think about exactly, as you said now, these new definitions of meat and uh, what is, you know, like for the clarity, you know, clarity, what is, might be confusing, particularly for this group, and uh, fairness even in, this, in the understanding of fairness and, of course, flexibility. Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, first of all, the, the difference between individual and societal, just the, just the basic difference is that, I mean, there, there's this research that's been done um, by a couple of Dutch researchers, at least, um, where they, they made the distinction between people's reactions that, you know, if they do have this strategic ignorance, it means that they are already using coping strategies and they are uncomfortable with um, eating meat. And then other people are not uncomfortable. So then they don't have strategic ignorance. And so that's the difference between individual and, and societal. And, and it's based on, on this kind of research. Um, but then in, in terms of the new meats, I mean, th this is something that I haven't quite thought through how they, what, what their role can uh, be. Sorry, Nina, just to interrupt you here, can you maybe say what the meat paradox is for people who might not know this? Or yeah, right, okay. That? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's the, um, we, people, people love eating meat. At the same time, they don't want to hurt their dog, for example, or the neighbor's dog or animals in general. So there's this conflict between killing animals for your food and then, you know, people employ coping strategies and they try to push that away and not be aware of it, you know, what the, what goes into the, how, how the, how the meat ends up on, on your plate. So, so that's the paradox between wanting to eat meat and yet not wanting to hurt animals. Uh, and not, not everybody um has this paradox in, in, in themselves but but most people still do most people who eat meat um yeah so the so the role of the new meats um the, the flexibility and clarity and fairness they refer to the consumption corridors as such um and i, I think the new meats um if we see them as, as actually meat, then they are just moving us further along the journey, further along um, towards less meat. Um, so that, that would be less, less conventional animal-based meat. Um, so that would be their contribution. But flexibility, I mean, yeah, fairness, not everybody have, has access, you know, if you go to, some places in the world, 
there's that's not an option, of course. Um, yeah, but but I, I think that's still something that in in the project itself can 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 be further explored. But but I just I just I just don't see them as a realistic option for you know replacing all current animal based meat. So therefore, yeah, it's it's a sort of a side role which I hope can just help the process. Thank you very much. I will now take out my, my video, but I'll be here still. Okay. Thank you so much. How about uh, other questions from our attendants now? We ha still have 10 minutes. Did you have further comments or questions for uh, Mina? Or, or for me, for that question, for that matter? Or would you like us to wrap up? Wrap up? Okay. Um, uh, I have one more question, if, uh, if I yeah, can ask please. one more. <laughs> Go ahead. I, uh, so, because uh, um, you mentioned um, the energy needs, let's say, in average, that were based the these uh, guidelines for how much meat should be eaten for each animal and you mentioned something very uh, relevant and interesting about uh, what has been the reference and how much this reference in a uh, total calories has been changed since yeah. the last uh, 45 years yeah and um and as i said i'm a uh, my background i'm a clinical dietitian and i've been working mostly with obesity and uh, and it's impossible to not you know to not overlap the increase of obesity exactly along these uh, forty mm -hmm. years, as uh, as you were saying that uh, in uh, up till eighties the the energy reference per day was around two thousand five hundred per man actually for men because for women it was even two thousand even lower right yeah okay so they're not considering women in this average. i mean the, I, the, you know the thing is also very interesting and i think touch upon what you're saying what are the needs which reference are we using actually when we are making uh, the statements of the needs right because usually we use uh, let's say um men in the let's say active phase of his life and uh, um, like not sedentary, but not too much physical active. So like light slash moderate active. So there is a figure behind this reference. There is a profile behind this reference, right? So how representative they are, they're representative for 50% of or even less <laughs> percent of the population. And that's what is also very interesting to discuss about what are the needs and um, that you were saying and of course together with the desires uh, in the other level uh, but um, it was very uh, relevant and interesting to hear you the this change uh, of uh, how much is being the total energy consumption as a reference per day and uh, of course if you eat more in calories we also need to have more food yeah. from different sources and in this case in the like we had mentioned meat right uh, so it was uh, and uh, at the same time we are not solving the problem of malnutrition we are actually increasing overweight and obesity in both developed and developing countries mm -hmm. so at the same time that you have in the countries particularly in the developing countries uh, under nutrition you also have overweight excessive overweight so it's um, it's a lot. It's uh, so we are we are uh, not actually um, um, going in a direction of solving some some of the problems connected to this uh, um, overconsumption, as you as you say, because this overconsumption is overconsumption on specific nutrients. It's not like overconsumption of vitamins or minerals or fruits or vegetables. It's overconsumption of very specific category of food. So it's actually very mono, mono thematic in the nutrition understanding. So uh, just to, just to to say that um, to add this part of in parallel obesity has been increasing exactly 
uh, at the same time that uh, as you were sh showing that the reference of uh, how much yeah. the energy per day yeah yeah that, that's really interesting yeah really interesting what you're saying yeah mm -hmm. I'm also thinking it's very interesting when you think of the consumption corridor also as a, uh, you know, like a kind of nutrition corridor as well, like in the sense that there, that there is also the kind of bounds that would be placed by uh, our nutritional needs and also uh, mm. uh, you know, sort of boundaries for what would be the healthy uh, consumption. So yeah, very interesting. Uh, it would be interesting to join these two concepts somehow. Um, and as you said, in a way, like you had this, uh, com uh, just continuing on this, um, you had this comment of sort of aligning the, or uh, adjusting the national food guidelines to the Eat Planetary Health Diet. But the, uh, there's also the other policy of, oh, sorry about that. Um, of uh, aligning uh, guidelines also for agricultural production mm. so and subsidies for agricultural production with this uh, with the uh, dietary guidelines for example let alone like the planetary health diet <laughs> guidelines yeah but there's yeah. not even that kind of alignment of like oh if we are telling people to eat more fresh fruit or pulses, then we should actually be subsidizing these uh, vegetables and fruit production or plants, I guess, pulses in our agricultural policy. So that's also an interesting kind of uh, po possible tool. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, okay, everyone. So uh, do we have further questions or comments? Uh, if so, I will maybe just finish by sharing my screen again and uh, advertising our next uh, our next speaker. Uh, so our next talk will be our next webinar. Thank you, Mina. Again, we can have a virtual clap uh, for Mina. And oh, I see maybe oh another question. Wait, wait, I rushed. Oh. I uh, yeah, yeah. It was a question on Q and A by David. So, um, shall we have a look at it, Mina? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do you want to read it? Production. Yeah, I can read it. Um, production methods are crucial to the discussion, not just consumption. There is evidence that the, that it is possible to produce meats, beef, lamb, goat, chicken, turkey, etc. On pasture without pesticides, hormones, etc. For that serve the nutritional needs of humans at the same time as sequestering carbon and reducing other planetary impacts. What production methods are there for plant production, which would presumably increase if meat consumption is reduced without such impacts? Um, plant production will not increase because all the fields that are now used to grow food for the cow, uh, for the for the animals, of course, then can be used partly, and they don't all have to be used, but part of them can be used um, for growing food for humans instead of the animals when there's less meat production. Um, and also, just to add to that, I think similar methods can be used for uh, plant production. You can think of regenerative farming and sort sure. of farming, um, instead of monoculturing, sort of having a, a diversified uh, plant-based uh, yeah. farm. So uh, yeah. But, yeah, there is. And, and of course, there's also the argument that, um, that if, if grazing cows or whatever um, are useful for carbon sequestration, they don't need to be eaten. The farmers who are grow who are taking care of the cows can be paid to take care of the cows. They can live for thirty years, you know, grazing. They don't have to be eaten after. Well, the milking cows are eaten after um, are killed after five years. I forgot what it is for for meat cows, but it's uh, maybe uh, it's it's a lot less actually. I think. So there's always like using, you know, 
the arguments slightly in a way that um, doesn't actually serve the purpose that uh, um, yeah yeah is that okay anyway, I just wanted to bring that argument <laughs> in. Um, can I say something I yes, mean I thank please. you for your response um, it, that seems to bring in another argument which is something about why wouldn't you eat cows like if you're producing them is there another argument that's i'm interested in what the assumptions are underneath the arguments mm -hmm. uh, is there an assumption that it would the planet would be better off if you didn't eat cows or we would be better off if we didn't eat cows or goats or sheep or whatever i mean well, I'm interested certainly in the assumption. cows would be better off if we didn't <laughs> Well, I don't know. Uh, um, the the, well, the, the yeah. evolutionary argument is that the animals that are eaten are the most successful. If, if you're thinking from a race perspective or a racialized idea of health. No, I'm thinking of a... Maybe, uh, you know, the, the cow race, you know, is dominating the planet. But would you really want to be part of that dominant cow race? <laughs> I, I mean... Uh, well, I think that, as an uh, individual cow, you depends, of course, on on the the type of farming and the well, yeah. you know, the animal welfare definitely can vary uh, from method of sort of livestock farming to another one to another. Um, yeah. But arguably, a healthy animal doesn't want to die. So uh, most of the the animals that we consume are healthy animals that would presumably would like to continue their life and a healthy plant does want to die uh well a healthy and what about all the microbes the what about the billions a... of microbes that the plant is supporting <laughs> that you're going to kill by eating the plant i mean the argument uh, this is why i'm interested in the assumptions behind the argument uh we we can get into a, a mental corridor if i can uh, uh, uh slightly abuse your mm, mm, uh, metaphor you know we can get into mental corridors in which we assume that the world exists in the corridor and i don't uh, I, i'm so i'm interested in exploring the the what is what is what is holding us into these corridors what what, what are the assumptions that 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 we're making in that process and um and for example uh to just to use an example that was raised by our nutritionist friend i can't see her name see. um uh, there's an assumption that an apple is an apple an apple is not an apple an apple is a source of nutrition and if we are producing plant-based materials which don't satisfy the nutritional needs um um uh, the way they used to say you know, 100 years ago then you know, that can cause all sorts of problems like, you know, that's impacts on the obesity issue, for example, because the amount of the volume of food that you eat has to vary depending on the nutritional quality of the food. There's a lot of different aspects to this. And so if you're going to replace meat production with, which of course is not perfect, and I'm not arguing for that. I'm arguing, I'm seeing, trying to see the whole picture. Um, if you're going to reduce if you're going to replace the eating of meat thank you with the eating of plants i'm sorry i have to cut you off a little bit because i see we're over time yeah. uh i don't know mina if you have a final comment on the assumptions that we are you know the assumptions behind this concept um and uh yeah the, the assumptions is that we are over consuming meat and we need to reduce it to solve the various crises that we have. Um, and yeah, so we are not saying that we are replacing all meat with plants. I mean, this is not the idea. So it's just about reducing radically, yes, but still. Okay, uh, I will uh, thank you everyone for this lively discussion and thank you for your contributions and I will finish with a coming uh, attraction. Uh, so um, just bear with me, I'm going to share my screen. And so yes, again, thanks for joining us.
thanks for your input and uh, your uh, contributions. This this was me. I don't know if I even said my name. I'm Sofia. Uh, and uh, next week we're gonna hear from Mani Sadredini, uh, who is also a specialist in um, uh, health science and medical sciences, and he's going to talk about meat and the nutritional aspects of meat. So uh, Silvia is uh, very graciously going to share this session for us, this webinar. Thank you again, Silvia. And I'm going to finish with our jingle. More meat, less meat. Heartbeat. I will teach you not to bite me. More meat, less meat. What is actually meat? Thanks again, everyone, and see you next uh, in a few weeks. It's on the 26th of uh, October. So thanks and uh, see you soon. See you.